What's the deal with airplane peanuts? peanuts? Kill Tony is currently on one of the best runs of their entire 11 year history, averaging nearly 1.5 million views an episode to start 2024. But it's not just the views that are at an all time high for Kill Tony, because the quality of comedians being pulled out of the bucket has also been off the charts so far this year. And in this video, we are taking a look at four of the most electric bucket pulls thus far, including the YMH employee who roasted Tony Hinchcliffe. You've been funny your whole life? You're 21 years old. Were you a little rabble rouser in school? Such a rabble rouser. <laughs> okay. The man with the best first time appearance in show history. This very m m well may be the best first time performance of anyone ever in the history of the show. A former rapper turned comedian who started a wave of Reddit memes about Tony's matching jackets. They were in family and friends kill Tony jackets. Okay, that's not matching jackets. Oh. And a 500 pound comic who received $22,000 for life-saving surgery. You should do a GoFundMe and when this episode comes out, we'll <laughs> funnel people to it and maybe it'll change your, you don't have long to live. This is the best of the bucket, starting in order of most recent appearances. Unless your name is David Lucas, brand new bucket polls trying to roast Tony Hinchcliffe never seems to go well. You suck, dude. But someone on Kill Tony 656 was able to pull it off more than once. Hannah, you're a freak of nature. Have you been funny your whole life? You're 21 years old. Were you a little rabble rouser in school? Such a rabble rouser. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Son of a I bitch. I swear to God. Do you, Spank it, Tony. Disrespect it. <laughs> wow. You guys are gonna f <laughs> Tanner Amiglio is not only the newest member of the Kill Tony universe, but he's also directly involved in the podcast scene, working full time for one of the most well known production companies in all of comedy. So, Tanner, how do you make a living? I work for Tommy Buns and Mama Jeans. Wow. Yeah. One of our guys here, I don't know how many people know yet that we have young Tanner oh who God. works here. He's been here for a minute, started doing stand up. Just a few weeks ago, he did the uh, Kill Tony That's show. That's right. And he had a great set, and they invited him to do the secret show. Okay, so, Tanner. Tanner, how are you, buddy? Doing great. How fun was it to do Kill Tony? So much fun. It was a really good time. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. And it you had a good. great set? Yes, yes. So will you be doing the show again? Is that how, like, will you go back? Um, well, I'll do secret show tonight, which is Red Band show. Um, but I have to get pulled out the bucket again. And unbelievable. Yeah, I was actually uh, switching on the podcast when you were on Not Today, pal. Oh, okay. Yeah. And Hell you, yeah. And you asked, um, so when... <laughs> <laughs> this crossover between a YMH employee being pulled on to kill Tony and not only doing very well during his 60 seconds of stand-up, but also leaving Tony Hinchcliffe speechless during the interview is someone we had to learn more about. All right, well, we are here with the rabble rouser himself, Tanner Amiglio, after his appearance on Kill Tony 656. The first question that I think is on everyone's mind is that you are one of the few people to ever talk Tony during an interview and have it go well. Instead of getting mad or shutting it down, you seem to really find your comments funny. So is that a predetermined thing to do that impression and make fun of him if you got your name pulled? Not really, no. I knew I was going to bring up like that I switched on his podcast when he was on uh, Not Today Pal with us, but I, I wasn't planning on doing the impression. It was kind of in the moment. I was like, oh, it'd be kind of funny to take a jab at him because, uh, you know, we're all, we're all comedians at the end of the day. I think like if you're a comedian, you kind of step into that world of, yeah, what goes around comes around. So like you mentioned, you're switching on his podcast on Not Today Pal. You currently work for YMH Studios. What is your official job there and how is it at YMH working behind the scenes? So my official title when I'm in studio, it's uh, I'm just the intern yeah. and then uh, if we're on set somewhere i usually pa so production assistant on danny brown show i do the i'm a camera operator and then sometimes like if there's a hand needed somewhere i'll be in the booth logging or switching on a podcast i saw your brief interview with uh tom and christina on ymh recently a little less roasting energy there but was still very funny i assume that's because they're your bosses but how often do you get to like directly interact with them uh quite frequently actually they come in uh we do uh recordings about like once a week so usually eat lunch with them which is fun um they're always around the office talking to everybody uh, seeing how everyone's doing it's a it's great it's a great atmosphere i'd say how long does that internship last um so i the uh, original internship lasted from around like the end of August, so August 31st until 
December 31st. It was like a fall semester internship, but they just decided to keep me on board, which I'm super thankful for. Oh, that's awesome. So are you still in school right now or is this just... No, no, I dropped out. Oh, that's dope. Out, like, yeah, I've been to like three different schools now i've and i've dropped out of everyone i haven't haven't completed anything really <laughs> so well you've been doing stand-up for 11 months now you currently work for a massive comedy brand and you're only 21 years old what is your ultimate career dream in this industry i want to be uh i want to be a very well-known stand-up comedian and i want to uh, hopefully what tom has on my own production company and you know be able to do it what were you know all of this i think yeah. that's uh, a dream right now for me it's almost like an internship to be a comedian which is crazy that that exists. Like you, it, it it is. It's a lot more than I expected, in a in a great way. And like, it's not only that Tom and Christina I'm interacting with on a weekly basis. Like we have other comedians that are coming in all the time. They will come do our show, and later on they're going to do Joe Rogan's show or Kill Tony. So it's like nonstop. So I think that has helped me be able to kind of calm nerves on stage if I'm ever in front of like big name comics. So, mm -hmm. all right. Well, another kill Tony question for you here. We saw red band invite you on the secret show. How'd that end up going? It went great. It was a really fun time. I did the, I did the, I've done the secret show twice now. Oh Both my. went well. Um, I think my second uh, time was was a lot better though. It was super fun uh, being in the green room and like seeing professional comics just walk in and out and like being in that world uh, was a trip. So uh, just taking it all in has been has been cool. Yeah, th we hear these high level guys talk about how great Austin is for developing comedians, how all the young people are moving there, but they're already so established. So it kind of just feels like, all right, that might be true or it might not be true. As a 21 year old hitting these mics, what is the truth about Austin as developing, you know, a young comedian? I think it's great. I think it's great. If you go, if you're going into it with the right mindset, I think it's, I think it's, the best place ever you know uh it's very competitive i would say but i think it's a good i think that's a good thing you meet great people there's people that are traveling in through and out like from chicago new york la australia like you meet people all over the world so it's like a, i think it's a great spot for comedians to kind of come up in you just got to find your crowd and you know always have fun that's like the yeah. most important thing i'd say is have fun mark norman and dan soder they were the people on your panel when you got pulled out on kill tony if you could pick any comedians to be the guest on that show when you got pulled out who would you pick i would have loved i would like uh one to, one that would be really cool would be joey diaz i think like oh yeah that would be awesome and then yeah probably just joey diaz on that on that panel i think that would be cool to do stand up in front of him that would yeah. probably for sure. All right. Well, Tanner, thank you for your time today. I have one more last question before we go. We'll get you out of here. Is it true that you live in a storage container? I I, I lived in a shipping container for for about a year before I moved to Austin. Yeah. How it was that, uh, that like? It was interesting. No running water, no electricity, no insulation. Just me and my box. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, where can people find you on social media? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Instagram at Tanner Amiglio. My last name is A M I G L E O. A lot of people that up but that's okay you know it's whatever <laughs> um i'm on tiktok same as my instagram handle yeah and uh if you uh want to book a young comedian uh <laughs> hit me up you know I'm, I'm always i'm always down next up is the one and only carlos lopez carlos lopez the kill tony cowboy thank you so much for coming on the show today you were in two really big episodes the first one with bobby lee and burt kreischer it's already at two million views on youtube and then four weeks later you get pulled again with matt mccusker on stage how's this ride been for you since getting on kill tony are the horses treating you different what's going on man it's been wild it's unreal it, it doesn't feel real at times to when you sit and think about it, I try not to. Never, never really thought about this really happening the way it did. I always had the idea, like a lot of other people, to go and sign up for Kill Tony one day. Mm -hmm. I was just in the area. It wasn't like, hey, I'm going to be there, you know, in town for this. For everything to just happen the way it did, I mean, it was insane, all, all of it. Yeah. How long have you been a fan of the show before signing up? Been a couple of years. Um, I heard about it on, on Rogan a while back and I remember seeing it when I was at the comedy store and I didn't know what it was then. Man, I'm kind of regretting not going and watching it when I was over there. Yeah. Well, it all worked out perfectly for you. Tony called your first appearance, maybe the best first time performance in the history of the show. What does that mean to you? I want to appreciate that 
and also at the same time not let it get to my head right i mean i, I feel like i have so much to learn and so much more ahead of me i want to appreciate it but at the same time i want to i want to not let it uh get to my head like i said but for someone who is literally brand new to stand-up comedy with two very solid minutes under your belt what's the process like of writing new jokes everybody's been asking me this and they're like how long have you been writing jokes and this started recently i think i wrote down my first joke i'm like hey this is a joke i would tell on to somebody mm -hmm. i've always had like funny thoughts that come to mind and I, th I think the only difference now is i write them down i'll, I'll be going down the road. A lot of, most of my joke writing happens while i'm at work either on the road or or just sitting around waiting for something and something will pop in my mind it'll be quick let me write it down before i forget it because i forget so so much probably almost half of what uh, i think is funny I, I forget to write down i'm like what was that thought i had earlier yeah that, that's kind of been my process i don't really sit down with a pen and paper and like, all right, we're going to write a joke right now. I just, it's just shit that pops in my mind. Yeah, that's awesome. Do you find a lot of parts of your life that you could make funny? Because, you know, you're on the road all the time. You're hauling horses, but it's not that relatable. Do you want to write jokes about some of the stuff you experience every day, you know, with horses, with cattle and stuff, but you feel like not many people would get it? There is a lot of that. You know, I'll, I'll write a joke and I'm like, well, this this don't make sense, you know? And, and so I do, I do have, you know, to think of a lot of things that are funny to me in an agriculture setting. I go to a lot of farms i meet a lot of people you know customers and stuff at horse shows and stuff and i'll i'll kind of try a lot of these jokes out on people and i'm like all right this gets good response like it's funny but only to the horse people or only to the ag people you know and, yeah uh, you know i still write them down and i still got them but on episode one i made a reference to like buckle bunnies or something like that and i guarantee actually uh after the show somebody came up to me like hey man i i was laughing my ass off at that part but uh nobody knew what you're talking about i'm like yeah i figured that part out in a moment well i also noticed that you were looking down at your hand on stage are you jotting down premises on your hand or was that just a funny thing that you acted out <laughs> so actually yeah I, I uh i did i did have you know, two or three jokes uh, written down because at the end of the day, I'm still new to this and I don't really have, you know, material memorized as well as some of these, you know, professional comedians that are, they, they got, they can just go into a bit. So yeah, I, I did actually have like two or three jokes written on my hand and it, just the first word or two on it, just to kind of get me started on the first episode, I got pulled and I was somewhere, nowhere I should have been. I was inside the building, but I wasn't in the crowd, like immediately in the crowd. I was pretty, it took forever to get to the stage and I was kind of out of breath and um, I forgot all my jokes. I, and I feel like that's a common thing for people their first time ever or just first time on Kill Tony. I just get on stage and I, I think I said the word, I was like, well, yeah. And everybody laughed and it kind of gave me literally one or two seconds to kind of like, all right, what are we going to say? Well, the jokes I told wasn't even what I was planning. I had better jokes. I felt like, it wasn't even what I was planning on telling. I, I guess it was a presentation or something, but I don't, I don't know. It seems so calculated, and that's probably why it was such. It was so shocking to figure out that was your first time ever doing stand-up. But we also saw you get invited to perform at the Mothership Bottom of the Barrel show. How did that go? I don't want to say it went great, and I don't want to say it went bad. Uh, I learned a lot, but also, like, all right, that humbled me. Um, I got to watch Rogan and Ron White and Brian Simpson and all these killers go up, mm -hmm. and then... There's me. So I'm, I'm watching the show. I don't even know if I should have done this, but I was watching the show to kind of like, well, how do you do what these people are doing? And I got up there and I, I got some laughs and, and I'm not going to say I didn't get a laugh. I don't know how any, any of that worked. And I also didn't ask any questions. So, so like the, there's a light to tell you like when it's time to come off. And I got to understand how that works. So I was trying to, while I'm telling jokes, I'm trying to figure that out. Like, what does this light mean here? What's the clock? Like, <laughs> I didn't ask how much time to do. I think I lasted like uh, just shy of six minutes on there but i feel like i kind of i might have ruined the time in in that moment uh not ruined but messed up the, the timing in the moment and and all that but it was a huge learning experience and I, and I got an applause like all right you know that's been my you know that's my mm -hmm. time or whatever i think i heard that's a very healthy crowd like they know it's it's an improv deal and it might not grow like some polished material goes i've always thought that show was very very difficult and it's it's interesting to see from your perspective yeah there was comedians there that night they're like hey man you know i saw you this night you're funny and they're like what are you here for because it was on a it was on a tuesday and mm -hmm. i was like i'm doing bottom of the barrel and they're like you're doing what <laughs> like they were i wouldn't say scared of it but they're like i'm not gonna go sign up for that and so now i'm like well shit what am i doing here you know yeah yeah it's like a money where your mouth is show like you could get exposed or you could rise and it seems like he, you know you did a good job just hanging in there too which is super impressive another thing that was impressive was your interviews in both these kill tony appearances they were just as funny if not more than your actual stand-up which we both know goes a long way in kill tony in the kill tony universe going into this did you have any plan of what you wanted to talk about what you wanted to do for the interview portion or were you just letting it rip man i had no plan i didn't know what to expect i 
didn't even think about the interview part. I was like, if I could just get through the joke telling part, I'm good. So yeah, that was all just on in the moment. Yeah, not all those jokes land and, and stuff. And they're not even really jokes. For me personally, I don't have any like, all right, this is material for the interview. It's none of that at all. Maybe I should start doing that, but it, it might not sound as like organic. I, I feel like I got pretty lucky with guests so far, like Bert and Bobby and then Matt McCusker is freaking awesome. So I feel like they had a large part to play in it. Well, Carlos, thank you so much for your time today. I have one more final question before you know we get you out of here. Tony asked you most of the interesting questions about your cowboy lifestyle, but is there anything we'd be surprised to know about the process of horse hauling? Whenever I say I haul horses, they picture like, Farmer Brown and a pickup truck going down the road. I'm in a big, you know, 18 wheeler with a custom horse trailer that's, uh, you know, specially made for that. And I'm hauling really high profile horses. Like I've hauled horses for uh, a lot of high profile, like trainers, but also people like the, uh, Whoever owns the guy that owns Dubai, I think his name's like Sheikh Mohammed or something like that. But so, I mean, we we fly them too. We have like an airline. Wow, really? That's probably the most shocking part for people is like, you fly horses. How does that work? You have specialized crates for the horses. And then a, a special crew, pretty much like horse flight attendants, I guess you could say. We call them grooms. Are these mostly uh, racing horses? Like well, I used to haul a lot of race horses. Um, now I'm hauling a lot of what they call warm blood, show horses, hunter jumper, stuff like that, dressage. Different reasons. You know, somebody buys a horse from Europe or South America and they want to fly it to America because that's what they, you know, they're getting it delivered. Yeah. Do you have your own horse? It's hard enough to keep myself fed and, and, and taken care of. <laughs> yeah. People always ask me, are you married? You know, I'm like, no wife, no kids, no dogs, no goldfish. Yeah. And you are all over the place. Do you think it's possible? Like you said, you were in New Mexico recently, like, you know, looking up open mics there, popping into shows. Like, could you set up your own tour based on the horse hauling schedule? Yeah. If I, if I knew what I was doing, more, like the world of comedy, if I knew it better, I could probably pull it off uh, relatively, you know, easy mm -hmm. i'm in the fort worth area right now and there's an open mic at hyenas and i'm like i don't know what i'm getting into i don't know even know what time to show up but i'm gonna go show up and ask some questions you know if i can try to get a spot on an open mic that'd be awesome yeah i've had a lot of people reach out trying to book me i guess they didn't see kill tony itself they just seen clips and they're like you know this guy's funny mm -hmm. so i've had people they're like oh how, how long's your set i'm like Phew. I got two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we still have two more comedians to go in this video, including one who walked away from the show with over $20,000. But first, let's take a closer look at Mike Ryan. We're here with Mike Ryan after his impressive performance on Kill Tony 654. Mike, thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, my first question for you today, is it true that you've only been doing stand-up for four months? And if so, how is it possible to come off so composed and in control on stage? Uh, yes. So actually, it was at that time, it was closer to three and a half months. Uh, here in Houston, we have a really, really good comedy scene. The way I describe it is that uh, Austin has it going on, but Houston's where it's at. As far as developing as a comedian, I mean, I could hit four open mics in a night if I wanted to, and that's every night of the week. The Secret Group is kind of my home base you know, comedy club. They have comedy every single night, open mics five nights a week. Uh, Axel Rad for Punchline. It's hosted by Jeff Joe. That's so that's actually a one minute mic that's competition based. Going to that every week really gave me the ability to um, to hone in those one minute jokes. Yeah, but even like three and a half months doing it all the time, five nights a week, you still had this composure of like a professional comedian. I mean, it's so impressive. Like I said on the show, I used to be a rapper, and uh, so I was used to performing um, in front of a thousand plus people mm. on pretty much on a weekly basis. Um, but I will say that comedy is way more nerve-wracking i get more nervous in front of comedy in front of 20 people than if i was to rap in front of a thousand people that is interesting but it kind of makes sense i guess when you did rap on the show it went very well but it obviously seemed like it wasn't your you know first choice to freestyle on kill tony what was going through your head the moment that you told them that you used to be a rapper you had to probably see this coming that they'd want to hear something as soon as i said it i was kind of like oh shit <laughs> i was like they're gonna make me do it and then they did it. and i mean luckily uh, when i performed it was all freestyle so i would just like freestyle over to step for like an hour now even though if it's a freestyle it's basically like freestyles that i had in the past recorded and they're just kind of stuck in my head now so i actually just got pulled again my second episode will be coming out soon oh let's go yeah and uh i rapped on that one it did not go as well <laughs> so the, to me the rap was better um it was much better my joke went well I mean, as everybody knows, Tony's in different moods on different nights, you know, was not not nearly as nice to me as he was the first time. <laughs> but being an actual fan of the show, I respect that. You know what I mean? Like, I want him to be himself just like the way that I'm just going to be myself, you know? Uh, when I did Secret Show, uh, you showed up in the green room. You and your entourage were all wearing matching 
uh, jackets, and it was like the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And you walked in, and you just fucking roasted everybody in the room. What and then matching left. jackets? The fuck Dude, are you? Every so time somebody's like, "Hey, I need to just tell this story," they just go into some made-up shit. No, dude, you had the. They were in family and friends kill Tony jackets. Okay, that's not matching jackets. Oh. Also, on your first appearance, you mentioned that your joke writing process is to individually prepare one-minute sets, one-minute jokes, and then put them all together if you need to do a longer spot. But it sounds like it's perfect for the uh, spot in Houston that does the competition. Is this strategy influenced by Kill Tony, or is that just the easiest way for you to write jokes in your head? Definitely influenced by Kill Tony. My only goal in comedy was to get on Kill Tony. Um, so I talked about on the show um, how a guy at work had showed me, introduced me to Kill Tony, and mm -hmm. then that was also right around the time that my wife left. I would just binge watch it, binge watch it, binge watch it. And then the guy at work was like, oh man, we should do this and this and that. You know, it, it, it was kind of his dream to do it. He ended up going back to Louisiana and I kept watching Kill Tony. And then uh, when my roommate, when I, I mentioned on the show, I moved in a roommate. Yep. Like, hey, we should start doing comedy. You know, let's go hit some open mics and this and that. So he was really the one that kind of, you know, suggested that I, I get out there and start working on comedy. You also mentioned on Kill Tony that you grew out your mullet just to be on the show, which made me laugh because I got to ask you, I've been trying to figure this out. What does having a mullet have to do with being on Kill Tony? Uh, I just thought that it made me look like more of a character. <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess so. One one night, I decided to go hit the open mic, and I wore that uh, blue shirt and the khakis. And I was like, oh, it's kind of like a Forrest Gump thing. So that's when I started doing that. And I I had actually written that joke uh, to say that Hans Kim was the one that called me fat Forrest Gump. But when I was backstage, I was like, hey, did Hans go on first? And they're like, no, he's not going on till May. It was Casey Rocket. So I was like, that it doesn't work as well with Casey Rocket. And I was like, so what am I going to do? But then I remembered that Jackson, my friend, went on first, so I could just say it was, it was him, you know? I was feeling pretty good to this gay comic back there. He said I'm dressed like Fat Forrest Gump. <laughs> His name was Jackson Nami. We went back the next week to sign up again, but I mainly went to try to get on the, the Mothership open mic. And uh, when I was signing up for the Mothership open mic, Cam Patterson uh, walked by and I was like, hey, what's up, Cam? And he was like, Oh shit, Mike Ryan. He's like, you're funny as fuck, dude. And he's like showing me so much love. And then he was like, oh man, what are you doing tomorrow? Come do the regulars at Vulcan. So I oh, drove man. back to the regulars at Vulcan and just, I mean, it crushed. I did my uh, five minutes. The Two days later, I did the secret show and I did my five minutes there. I think I did seven there actually, but it was it was great. Trey Campbell went on after me um, and uh, Uncle Laser went on before me. It was a great experience for sure. Brian Holtzman was on that lineup. Mm. Oh man, you know, you're sitting in a room with all your heroes. It kind of blows your mind. Mind. Two days ago, I was on the regulars again. So I did the regulars twice, Secret Show, and now uh, my second Kill Tony episode will be airing soon. All this is happening. I know you said that Houston is where it's at and Austin's got it going on, H-Town till you drown. Is Austin not an option for you or is it just close enough that it doesn't? you'd rather stay at home? It's a two and a half hour drive. Okay. And driving's like nothing to me. I was I used to be a professional driver, so like two and a half hours there. I mean, every time I've gone there, I've gone there and back. I never stayed the night. Damn, really? And uh, every time that I've gone there, someone that's ridden in my car has got pulled. Wow, you got the lucky car, dude. And now you're two for two? Okay, and I take that back. So every time but one, but the one time that, some, that someone from my car didn't, this girl named Trish uh, stepped on my shoe and then five seconds later, she got pulled. Oh, damn. So now when I go, people are like, oh, let me rub your belly for good luck and all yeah. this stuff. Is the anticipation in those two and a half hours just so much fun? You and some comics being like, one of us is going to get on there talking about nerves, talking about what you're going to do. Just or... hanging out with comics in general is is great. I mean, um, you know, comedy really saved me. I mean, like, you know, everybody that watched the show know that I, you know, went some, to tra some traumatic events. Mm -hmm. And uh, that wasn't even all of it like before that like my dad had passed during 2020 yeah. like it was just it was just a lot of stuff when when my wife left it was kind of like the final show I was like all right I've been through enough traumatic events in my life that I guess I could do comedy now yeah <laughs> because every comedian that I've met is they've uh you know they're not I wouldn't say they're unhappy people but they've had to overcome a lot and right. they've Comedy has been instrumental to the, what the things that they've overcome. 
As someone who signs up for Kill Tony, you know you're going, you're making this trip to go there. Is there a difference between the nerves for your 60 seconds of jokes, because that's who you are, you're a comedian, you're going out trying to sell people on that you're funny on stage, versus the interview portion where you could be paired up with, you know, anyone from Matt McCusker to Post Malone to Joe Rogan and Tony, who's a very good roaster, he's very quick on his feet, obviously. Is there a different nerve for each one of those categories before a show yeah the interview i knew was make or break and i don't i don't think my interview could have gone any better on my first appearance like i said for the one that's coming out my joke went well but my interview i felt it didn't um, <laughs> but then like 30 people stopped me in the street afterwards to tell me how great the whole thing was so maybe that's in my head we'll see when it airs and also like as soon as you walk through the curtain and, and jackson said this as well you kind of black out. Mm. When I first got finished, I couldn't remember anything that I said. The question was, I didn't remember rapping. Little pieces would just come to me over the next few hours while we're driving home or whatever. It's like, oh, this happened. Oh, I did this. And last but certainly not least is the heavyweight champion of the world, who was not technically pulled out of the bucket, but more so fell out. We're here live with the heavyweight champion of the world. My first question for you today, how long were you a fan of Kill Tony prior to getting pulled out of that bucket? I didn't even realize Kill Tony was in Austin for the longest time because I wasn't keeping up with it. I think I found out about it in like October that it was in Austin and I was like, oh wow, it's in Austin now. So that's when I found out about it really. Within just a few days of your episode being posted, the Kill Tony fan base has already exceeded your original GoFundMe goal of $16,000. Did that surprise you at all by the power that this audience had to change your life? Yeah, uh, it, it surprised me like so much. I thought I thought nobody was even going to donate. And I was like, oh, wow, it's really happening. We've seen some pretty generous offers extended to other bucket pulls on Kill Tony from people buying hotel rooms for people that didn't have a place to stay. But raising $22,000 in just one week's time might be their most notable accomplishment yet to this point. Was receiving this type of gesture on your radar at all before signing up? Like when you walked on that stage, did you think that anything like this was in the realm of possibility? I had no idea. I really just wanted to be on the show, you know? I've been doing stand-up comedy like four nights a week now religiously for a few months i was like all right i'm way better at stand-up comedy let me try and get on the show and that's all i wanted to happen and i didn't even ask tony he just did it and i was <laughs> like okay yeah of course i'm gonna say yeah why not you know that was not my expectation at all so you said that you're taking comedy a little more seriously on and off 10 years but the last few months you're hitting four mics every single week how has this experience affected your view on austin are you considering relocating to austin now that you see all the comedic opportunity there or is the scene just as good in san antonio in your opinion the scene in san antonio is not as good as austin in fact i was going up to austin once a week to do open mic there and i was even up until last week i'm i was still doing stand up here in San Antonio at open mics and like it was like at a pizza place you know yeah. <laughs> and then like there's hecklers there and it's just not good and then last night I did open mic at Shakespeare's mm. and just completely crushed the whole crowd a lot of people had not like they've only seen me from Kill Tony and then when mm. I got on stage I just crushed it was amazing I was like finally this is what I needed That's one amazing. of my best friends told me she's like yeah you don't uh, hang your art in a bad art gallery you know what I'm saying <laughs> and I really took that metaphor so you live in San Antonio you know, like like we just said, you're a food vlogger down there on, on TikTok. How will this new weight loss journey affect that job? Since March, I've stopped getting paid from Instagram. Every creator been st has stopped getting paid from Instagram. So I, I kind of wanted to move away from making content like that anyway so yeah i just i just want to focus more on comedy and 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 i mean now that i have this opportunity at the least i can start a youtube channel on on my weight loss journey you know what i'm saying i think that's like the worst case scenario that could happen but it's for sure there i mean people know who you are now just from that one appearance and we're impressed tony said he wants to make you the middleweight champion of the world we're gonna try to make you the middleweight champion of the world i'm down baby have you been in communication with anyone from kill tony since the episode aired either they're following up on the surgery or asking you to come back at any point for a transformation or a reveal? I have asked if I could come back and there there has no, not been any official confirmation, but I, I mean, I'm sure they do want me back. I mean, they follow me now on Instagram and stuff and they watch my stories and I'm sure they don't want me to just fall off the wagon. <laughs> yeah, and it's like as fans of Kill Tony for a long time, we see these characters come into our lives and people, you know, identify with them and, and want to follow their journey and their story arc. So I'm sure a lot of people are going to be interested in following you from that one appearance just 
to wherever this goes. Do you feel any pressure with all these eyes on you now? Like, oh shit, now I actually have to do this. I thought I was just gonna tell 60 seconds of jokes and now I have like a responsibility on my shoulders. Yeah, no doubt. I, I feel so much pressure because I, I mean, all these people are like rooting for me and I'm like, <laughs> man, I gotta step my comedy game up. I, I feel like that's what they want as well. I was at Kill Tony last night at like the trying to get pulled last night and i mean there was a lot of supportive people i think there's there's some some that hate that is deserved you know what i'm saying like I, that was my first time signing up for kill tony and i got pulled wow. first like i don't even know like the mathematical possibility on that happening like what the number like i i, I don't even yeah. dude it's such a blessing it's so insane yeah i was gonna say there's definitely some resentment i would assume uh, from people who have been signing up for years and might even get up there and just be not even memorable at all like not only did you get pulled the first time but now you know people want to hear an interview from you because it was such a memorable experience it was a big deal that happened and that's kind of like what it is it's like a lottery for comedians to like, you know, you could get a golden ticket, you could get roasted, you could get $22,000. <laughs> like who knows what's gonna happen. I don't know if this is a sore subject, but you mentioned that you had plans to get this surgery, but in before, but lost the money in the crypto market. I'm just curious, what were those investments that came crashing down? How did that all play out? The weight loss and like the crypto go like hand in hand on like the timeline. Cause I was saving up money to get the surgery. You know what I'm saying? I had made a lot of money from crypto already. So I was like, I'm going to keep this money right here. It wasn't different coins. It wasn't just, it wasn't just one particular one. And they all kind of crashed at the same time. I remember one weekend, it was a Friday and I had lost like four grand and I was like, Hmm, that's pretty bad. <laughs> and then, um, then by the time Monday rolled around, I was like, I like, I like lost everything. I was like, this is Man. insane. What happened? I could pull up the dates, you know what I'm saying? For people to see like that I'm telling the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and it was pretty crazy, man. It, it, that was life changing. But at the same time, I was going to my doctors and I don't know how much I weigh right now, but at my heaviest, I was at 520. And then I did lose 80 pounds. Yeah. And then I mentioned my best friend passing. He passed away. I gained weight back. I mean, I probably weigh like... 480 right now and at the time the doctor wanted me to lose 50 pounds before he would do surgery so, so I, I, got, I got a doctor's appointment tomorrow so okay. we're gonna figure out what what every, what needs to be done that's pretty yeah cool. we're, you were gonna figure out like what if anything in my body has changed which it hasn't <laughs> dude <laughs> i got covid after i did kill tony oh really? i got covid and uh <laughs> I was so sick and I was just thinking about Tony like, you're not going to make it to the next taping, dude. And I was like, oh man, he jinxed me. Oh and my I'm God. Sitting, I was just sitting there sick. I was sitting there sick and I'm like, man, how cliche fat guy dies from COVID, bro. Like, <laughs> I thought I was going to go viral for dying. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I didn't even want to post on social media that I got COVID because people are just going to be like, what a fucking loser. Just like, <laughs> yeah, he got COVID. Of course he did. My last just question for you here, I guess, is like a lot of people see these comedians or not even comedians but just any celebrity in general when they try to like you know communicate that they have empathy for any sort of situation it always comes off a little backhanded because you know how much money they have like in general you know what i mean like any celebrity like trying to reach out always seems a little disingenuous to just normal people because it's like we know how rich you are i don't even know if this is a question but it's just bizarre to and cool to see like people who could actually do something about it so confidently say, oh, we can get that done in a second. And then it actually happens and exceeds. You were expecting $16,000 to get up to 22,000 the last time I checked. I mean, that's just amazing that they put their money where their mouth is and was like, oh, we have this diehard audience and we're gonna prove that it works. You, you know, I I, the, the surgery was 16,000, but like, I'm, I am going to need extra money for time off. Uh, it's up to six weeks of downtime. You know what I'm saying? Wow. And I, I mean, I, I got like a thousand dollars, you know what I'm saying? That I, I could lean on and mm -hmm. that's not going to last me six weeks, even if I got the surgery. So now I got money to last me for the six weeks and also to take a little bit of time off to focus on some comedy to, right. to get up to Austin more. Now I, now I can go up to Austin twice a week instead of once a week it's a blessing all around man and, and i'm I, I mean yeah man thank thank god it really happened all right well the heavyweight champ any closing remarks any social medias anything you want the people to know any last regards i have a youtube channel uh that i'm starting i'm starting to work on uh if you go to my instagram or my tiktok there's a link tree and you could get to my youtube from there i'm doing a lot more I'm, I'm getting booked now once i have like official dates i will be letting everybody know 
And I promise you, I don't suck at comedy. I was very nervous on Kill Tony. I'm better than mid. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you again. And speaking of great fan bases, a big thank you to everyone who voted in the Joke World March Madness bracket. The full video breaking down all the results from each and every round will be on the end screen right after this. But you can only watch it if you hit subscribe. At Joke World. That's it. At Joke World. And the world is W-R-L-D. That's a great uh, YouTube channel, Joke World. Check it out.